For 15 years, the world has been embroiled in a war between humans and demons. And while both sides suffered casualties, humanity was at a disadvantage. Just when things turned dire, a group of adventurers appeared as a beacon of hope. For reasons unknown, the human's great warrior, Yusha, decided to directly attack the Demon King alone. Was it because of impatience? No one knows for sure, but what we can be certain of is that he left his party to charge into the castle and slay the Demon King. Here is our hero, his sword drawn out, ready to take on the Demon King. Yusha then yells, Are you the Demon King? The long war with the demons ends here. Just as he's charging to strike him down, the Demon King turns around and Yusha discovers a shocking truth. The Demon King is a beautiful woman. He cannot believe what he's seeing as she greets him with a, Hello, hero. Who are you? Yusha yells, insisting that she cannot be the Demon King. To this, she replies that she is the Demon King he sought. Of course, why is she a woman if she's the Demon King? The Demon King explains that it's just the traditional title passed down and that she's the 43rd holder. They even call her the Ruby Eyes. Because Yusha still refuses to believe her, the Demon King decides to reveal her crest as proof. Unfortunately, or fortunately for Yusha, her crest is found just in her cleavage. Yusha backs away from this but then stands his ground. He's the hero and his job is to end the reign of the Demon King. Whether she was a woman or not mattered little. He has a job to do. Ruby Eyes then tells him that if Yusha swings his sword at her, she will merely dodge and then tell him hello again. Our hero gets flustered by this. Why is she so calm? At this point, the Demon King reveals to him that she has been waiting for Yusha for the longest time. The Demon King proclaims, Let the curtains rise on the first and perhaps last play of our hero and the Demon King. She then spreads her arms open and confesses her desire for Yusha. You will be mine, hero. Yusha quickly rejects her and tells her not to be stupid. So many nations fell because of the Demon King, and he isn't going to let them slip by just because she is a pretty girl that likes him. He explains to her that there used to be a lush nation filled with green that met its demise because of how the demons blackened the sky. The Demon King quickly retorts, saying that a nation that cuts trees and turns them into coal will obviously have dark skies. They polluted their own land. Yusha is dumbfounded by the term pollution. The Demon King supposes that he's not heard of it before. Yusha tells her to stop playing games and that demons possess the Tin's country minister. The Demon King could not help but sigh at this. Of course, do evil, get caught, and suddenly, demons are brainwashing you. Typical. It's a common way for politicians to wash their hands of their filth. Yusha then brings up the issue of the demons slaughtering hundreds of humans during the war with the southern nations. He saw that with his own eyes. The Demon King said that even they had casualties, but to this, Yusha says that it's something that must be done because demons are inherently evil. The Demon King takes out a scroll from her chest, and with that in hand, she approaches Yusha and responds to his tirades. Who decided that? Then perhaps you ought to have been God. She presents to him the scroll that contains an economic analysis of the war. Yusha stares at this. The Demon King realizes that Yusha has no idea what economics even is. Does she have to do everything here? Apparently, war is a booming business, especially for the Central Nations. The Central Nations' investments in the military of one kingdom helped it rise from ruin, given how they had no fertile farmlands and because of this, they had no choice but to continue fighting. Yusha argues the Central Nations send donations while getting nothing in return as it is out of the goodness of their heart. But the Demon King says otherwise. While having tea, the Demon King reveals what the Central Nations get from war is security. Yusha realizes there is some truth to this, given that the Central Nations seem to be vastly separated from the chaos of war. The Demon King proves her claim by making Yusha hold a magical lamp that will reveal to them his memories. The lamp transports them to a scene in Yusha's childhood where he attended luxurious balls every night as though there was no war. The King points out that he enjoyed extravagant parties and delicious food because of war. If the war ends, the economy will suffer, and many will become unemployed. Transporting back to the castle, the King continues as she reveals another ongoing problem. The higher-ups want to appear that these deaths are because of demonic sickness. Yusha's heart sinks upon hearing this revelation, but still refuses to believe it. And to make it fair, the king lets him see what's in her mind using the magic lamp. She elaborates that Yusha's world has not increased in agricultural production, meaning many places still suffer and people will continue to die from starvation. Only privileged nations truly earn anything from this war. Survival requires food, and at the rate humanity is going, all they will know is how to use swords. Hundreds of thousands, no, millions of people will die. 
As this is happening, a blonde woman and an old man traveling in a snowy forest discuss whether they should inform people that Yusha left them. Turns out, they used to be Yusha's party mates. They're worried that they might perceive Yusha as a coward. The blonde says she will not be able to handle such defamation on Yusha's part. The old man, on the other hand, says that this is something that they just have to do. Unfortunately, not even his own group knows why Yusha left. The blonde girl can only scream in frustration. The Demon King continues and says that if the demon wins, they will make colonies and enslave humans. They will come into conflict with their own. However, if the humans win, they will do the same. Yusha thinks that all of this is just absurd. Humans would never do anything like slavery, right? Sure, Yusha. Sure. With the magic lamp, they transport to a boat floating along a river bypassing hills. The Demon King shares that it's the place she's been dreaming of and wonders what it's like beyond the hills, connoting life beyond wars. Yet Yusha remains reluctant. The Demon King explains that if they follow the usual way these terms go, she will have half the world and he will have the other half. There would be barely any difference except the world will now be split under the Demon King and the human hero. Of course, at this point, she knows that Yusha will not agree to this. And as her last resort, the Demon King offers herself to Yusha, which shocks him. The King may seem to fool around to tease Yusha, but she means moving beyond the war with him. She says that even if she surrendered, the human kings would only hide it. And the demons would crown a new king as this is how necessary this war is for both parties. What the king desires is a way to end the war because doing so would give new hope not just to herself but to the entire world. If it's a hero's job to end the war, then it's the demon king's responsibility to find a way for it to end. Now, Yusha realizes why the ruby eyes wants him. But before the hero doubts her feelings for him, the king immediately clarifies that she wants him to go with her to the other side. She admits that she honors contracts above all else. And the kind of contract she would have with Yusha would bind her soul to his. She promises to stay by his side through sickness and in health. Yusha knows the seriousness of this alliance and it includes shedding more blood than he ever did before. After deliberating with himself concerning what will be the right thing to do, Yusha agrees to be the Demon King's ally. As Yusha is about to leave, he suggests sealing the contract with a handshake. Realizing that they have sealed the deal makes Ruby Eyes ecstatic that she suddenly hugs him. Yusha is taken aback that he pushes the king away, causing her to touch the magic lamp by accident. The lamp shows a memory of the Demon King practicing kissing using a Dakimakura of Yusha. Embarrassed by this, the Demon King asks Yusha to forget this happened. Oh, you. Before seeing him out, the Demon King suddenly removes her horns. It turns out they are detachable, much to Yusha's surprise. And yet, it's another discovery Yusha finds out about the Demon King. The Demon King and Yusha go to a small human village to start experimenting with a way to end the war by helping improve the villagers' lives. They are greeted by the Head Maid, who has been serving the Demon King since she was a child. They settle in a mansion the Head Maid prepared for them. The Head Maid says she had notified the village elder of their arrival. To keep the king and Yusha's identity, the villagers have been told the Demon King is a daughter of a noble family and a scholar of divinity who came to research and train local people in new agricultural methods. That night, the king instructs the head maid to spread a rumor in their world that she and Yusha were severely injured after a fight. As for Yusha, some are already speculating that he ran away. The Demon King plans to stay in the village for a year and will do her best to find a solution within that time. The following day, they explore the land and discover that soil fertility is depleting because of planting wheat in the same field. Because of this, the villagers rotate the crops in the fields in a three-stage cycle, summer, winter, and a field left to rest for a year. The king wants to propose a four-stage crop rotation that includes a field of barley, clover, wheat, and turnips that can feed the livestock every season so that they will have food all year round. The Demon King has a lot of ideas on how to help the villagers, but reorganizing the land management should be their priority. Unfortunately, the village elder is not keen on the idea yet. That night, the Demon King and Yusha share a relaxing moment by the fireplace. The Demon King displays her intellect and grace like a genuine person of good breeding while exploring the fields. However, when she's left alone with Yusha, she turns into a shy girl in front of her crush. Somehow, the Demon King finds it difficult to say the words she wants to tell him for fear of being misunderstood. Yusha encourages her to say it aloud, and she musters up her courage to ask Yusha to rest on her lap. Surprisingly, Yusha promptly agrees, saying that since he's hers, the king can do whatever she wants with him. Hearing this inspires the Demon King to do what she always wanted to do. She slowly leans toward his face. As she is about to kiss him, the horse suddenly makes a frantic neigh that alerts Yusha. Is there something lurking outside? He immediately gets up, much to the Demon King's disappointment. 
They head to the barn to check on the horses and find a young lady and a little kid hiding in fear. The headmaid informs them that the children are escaped slaves, which Yusha refuses to believe. Yusha claims there's no slavery in the human world as it is barbaric, but the headmaid insists there are slaves everywhere. The headmaid says she has been immediately reporting them and taking them back because escaping from their owners is a serious crime. Yusha objects when he hears that the headmaid will do the same with the slaves. Yet the headmaid insists that being incapable of determining their own fate is as good as an insect. She speaks her mind, saying she sees no value in taking the chance of jeopardizing their relationship with the village for the sake of mere slaves. Yusha is even shocked when the Demon King agrees with her. Although, the king shows little consideration to the poor children and orders the headmaid to feed them and provide decent clothing. Afterward, the slaves are now wearing clean and decent clothes, enjoying the delicious bread as though they haven't been fed for days. After eating, the young lady thanks the king and Yusha for their kindness. Despite her hesitation, she begs the demon king to delay their plan of reporting them. But before the king can respond, the headmaid arrives and harshly points out how bad their situation is to remind them of their inability to survive outside if no one takes them back. Insulted with how the headmaid refers to them, the little kid stands up for the young lady and tells her they will somehow get by because they stick together. The headmaid seems unaffected by the words of these pitiful slaves and says their effort to survive only means taking advantage of the generosity of those who will help them. They will only be a detriment to others. Yusha wants to interfere at this point, but the Demon King stops him to let him observe what the headmaid will do next. The headmaid once again reminds them of her belief that only insects are incapable of determining their own fate. She emphasizes her hatred of insects and refuses to accept those who are satisfied with just being an insect as humans. The young lady understands what the headmaid is trying to say. Don't act like an insect if you want to be treated as a human. Then with a softer voice, the headmaid teaches them to apologize properly, not as beggars or slaves, but as humans. She teaches the young lady to curtsy as a way of asking favor decently. It turns out that the headmaid is not trying to look down upon them, but she is giving them a lesson on how to treat themselves as humans. She then suggests letting them stay in the mansion as maids, and the demon king immediately consents, much to the surprise of the young lady. As time passes, living in the mansion makes the little kid happier. She tells Yusha that the demon king is teaching them many things, from making themselves food to writing and even math. And it got Yusha to think he's helping too little aside from hunting for food. Swordsmanship is probably the only thing he can teach someone, and he wonders if that would even contribute to achieving peace. Meanwhile, the Demon King is giving business lessons to the villagers. Her students include a son of a noble, a farmer, and even a former slave joins. The Demon King teaches economics and how the war affects it, leading to the starvation of many. However, with this variety of people with different perspectives on wars, it's a headache for the Demon King to make them realize how and why they should help end it. Nevertheless, the Demon King, together with Yusha, continues to find ways to strengthen the agricultural inputs of the village. They take a trip to a nearby village to visit a convent. Almost all human education and science rely on the church. That's why the Demon King hopes she can take advantage of the power of such an organization to aid the agricultural reform of the village. When they get there, Yusha is surprised to discover that the female knight he worked with is the nun running the convent. The female knight immediately slaps Yusha upon seeing him, and it's because he made her believe that he's already dead. However, a part of her also feels relieved that her comrade is alive. To explain the situation, the Demon King introduces herself as a scholar. She makes up a story that Yusha injured the Demon King, but he's attacked by hordes of demons, giving him no choice but to retreat and that's how she met him by chance and offered to take him in. In thanks, Yusha is now serving as her bodyguard. The knight believes her story and immediately apologizes for how she reacted. It turns out that the knight refused the reward money awarded to them when Yusha was declared dead as she felt it was wrong to profit from it. The convent is where she first became a knight to help. The Demon King notices the worried look in Yusha's eyes. The female knight recounts that one of their comrades, the mage, didn't accept the reward and even went to the demon city to fight alone. It is a shock to Yusha, but after noticing the knight still feels guilty about it, he owns up everything and reminds her that he has another reason for coming to the convent with the scholar. Then, with the potatoes they grow in the village due to the agricultural project, the Demon King requests the convent's aid in the project. However, the knight admits that if they're seeking financial support, the convent won't be able to help. The Demon King says they will be thankful if they can help financially, but she's asking them to teach the villagers new and more effective agricultural methods. And with that, the Demon King successfully secures the convent's support for their reform. Months later, the Demon King catches Yusha secretly packing his things in the middle of the night, and she immediately understands Yusha is worried about Mage, so he wants to find her in the Demon World. Although the Demon King is jealous and anxious that Yusha is temporarily leaving for a female comrade, she has no intentions of stopping him. Instead, she provides armor for him and a list of leaders he can trust. 
Before the Demon King lets Yusha go, she reluctantly asks for an affectionate goodbye. For months, they never even held hands, and because of this, the headmaid pushes the Demon King to take the initiative. The Demon King confesses that Yusha's relationship with the female knight and the mage greatly bothers her, and Yusha is taken aback by the straightforwardness. Then the Demon King leans closer to ask for a kiss, but the shy Yusha only kisses her on the forehead, which dissatisfies the king. Suddenly, Yusha immediately transports and disappears in just a blink of an eye. There is much more improvement in their agricultural experiment than in their relationship. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.